I am. I'm glad we're here today. I really am. Uh, we, we've kicked off this year, I think, with a life-transforming teaching series. So if, the, if you're new to New Life, my name's Jeff. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors on staff. Uh, and today I'm uh, the teaching pastor today. So uh, we are in a series called Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. I think everybody understands what that word means, right? Like a metamorphic change. Can you explain that? If I came around with a microphone, can you do that? The caterpillar to the butterfly, everyone gets that, right? And we just believe that as we look at the Bible, that God has a metamorphic change in his heart for you. What, what, all that means is this, that the current version of you, right, the current version of you has the potential to be God's version of you. That's the metamorphic change. That the current version of you can be God's version of you. Why? Why? Because you're good? No. Because you can figure it all out? No. And here's, the, here's the good news. Because it's in God's heart for you. You guys do realize right, that God's got good things in his heart for you. I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way because life gets hard. Is anybody else with me? All right, life gets hard. It feels like life is like climbing a mountain all the time. Anybody feel like that sometimes? Anybody feel like, hey, God, like, look, I don't know if you think I'm some kind of an earthly gymnastic person, but I don't know if I can jump over another hurdle, right? Like, where are these things coming from? So life can be that way, and then there are the moments when life is good and we tend to forget it. We tend to forget that God is there and that God's with us, right? We think that we're the ones that brought on the good things. I just want you to know today that God's got a picture of you. It looks a little different than what you're living right now. But it's in God's heart, and it's a spiritual metamorphic change. And God's endeavoring to move all of us from where we are to the picture he has in his heart for you. And guys, that's good news. Amen? I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that, that we worship a God who actually loves us. That we worship a God who is for us. That we worship a God that says, look, there's little that you can do to impress me other than to surrender your life to me. And if you'll do that, I will take you on a journey like you've never been on before. And I don't know about you guys, but that is good news. So I want to say a big hello to everybody worshiping at all of our campuses. Metamorphic change is what we're talking about in this series called Metamorphosis. And uh, last week I talked about how we are changed through surrender. Surrender. And if you didn't get a chance to watch that, please go to mynewlifechurch.com and listen to that first sermon in this series because it is the foundation for a metamorphic spiritual change in your life, becoming the person God has in his heart for you. Today I want to talk, though, about community and how God uses community to bring spiritual transformation to your life. Now, when we talk about communities, many times, you know, you think about the word community and you think, what, like a city or a town? It's a community. What community do you live in? And people would be like, I live in North Platte, or I live in Ogallala, or I live in Kearney, or I live in Pleasanton, or I live in Minden, or I live in Holdridge, or wherever it is that you live, right? And, and we kind of like have now have equated the word community to this geographic place that I live that I can go Google and it shows up on Google Maps. But that's not community in the sense of biblical sense. Community in a biblical sense is who are you doing life with? So when I ask the question and I flip it and I say, do you have community? And what community are you in? It would be a list of names of people that you actually do life with. That would be community. Now back in the day, in my grandparents, I still remember it, in my grandparents' neighborhood, it was an old, older kind of built neighborhood. We still have these neighborhoods, by the way. Um, but in this older style built neighborhood where, you know, um, few people had back porches. You remember, you remember the house that, um, you know, you walked, I walked out the back door. It wasn't a big sliding glass door. It was just a normal door. And it was just like a little stoop with a couple of stairs and you were in the yard. Come on, somebody. We still have those homes. We still have those homes. But if you live in anything that's been built since that era, then you'll discover that those homes used to have a front porch and that's where life was done. Right? That's where life was done. People came home, they, they, they went on the driveway next to their house, they had a little garage in the back if they were really blessed, right? And then they just parked there, and the people lived on their front porch. People played in the front yard, right? Kids ran around like that. I, I remember going to my grandparents' house, and that's what we did. But my house that I grew up in, from my parents, 
We didn't have the front porch. We had the front stoop that used to be like the, my grandparents' back stoop, right? Everything got reversed, and now the back of the house became the back deck. And that's where we all went to do life. And so the world has changed on us, and community then has changed as well. And we've moved from the front porch where we kind of know our neighbors and we know what's going on in each other's lives to I live in the back with my privacy fence so that I can do my thing and I don't have to do your thing. And by the way, I can be back there and I don't have to even talk to you as my neighbor. Some people don't even know their own neighbor's names. I mean, I'm talking about the person who lives next to you. Like, you know, some people don't even know what's going on with their neighbor. I'm thankful for my neighbor. I was out of town. I was out of town one, one time a couple years ago, and evidently my smoke alarms were going off in my house. And we don't even live that close to each other, but my neighbor was at least, you know, a good neighbor and knows me and was able to get a hold of somebody that could get a hold of me, and then he helped me solve the problem. I, mean, I love good neighbors. Come on, somebody. Right? You got to love a good neighbor. Right? Right? you got to love a good neighbor. Um, but we live in the back deck. So what does biblical community actually look like? The early church knew biblical community. So look at Acts chapter 2 with me. Okay? Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, gives us a beautiful picture of what biblical community actually looks like. It says this, that all the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the sharing and meals, including the Lord's Supper and a prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all, came over them all. And then the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and they shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord did what? He added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This is what I love. I, I kind of see these things happening in this passage. Notice this with me. Uh, one of the things they did was they devoted themselves to fellowship. It wasn't like fellowship was an optional thing to do. No, they devoted themselves. They gave themselves to it willfully and joyfully. Right? I mean, sometimes, sometimes we begrudgingly have someone over to the house. Right? Now look, have you ever had this moment happen between you and, and your spouse where all of a sudden they tell you, hey, so-and-so is coming over, and you didn't know about it, and now you're kind of like, do they really have to come over? Like, of all days, like today, I mean, seriously, like, can we postpone this? Can we move this around? I mean, have you ever had that conversation? If you have, you're human. All right, I just want you to know that. You're normal if you've had that conversation. The early church and community, they devoted themselves. They willfully gave themselves to it. They realized life was not meant to be lived on an island. Life was meant to be lived best with others. So they devoted themselves to fellowship. They shared meals with each other. Watch this. In someone else's house. What? That's interesting. They didn't go out and go, hey, hey, I want to spend some time with you. Okay, perfect. Where do you want to do it? Uh, let's go down to a local restaurant. Let's sit, in a, let's sit someplace that doesn't belong to either of us so that neither of us have to show much hospitality. All I have to do there is just have a conversation with you. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to really see how I live. You don't have to see my house. You don't have to even smell what my house smells like. You don't even have to know where I live. Like, I don't even know if I want you to know where I live. I'll meet you at the restaurant. <laughs> like, that for us is is like doing community, not for the early church. The early church was like, come to my house, be at my house, All right, and, then, and then I'll be at your house, and then I'll be at your house and your house, and then you'll be at my house, and maybe a couple of you will be at my house. I mean, it was that way, guys. In fact, when you go back and you look at what you know, God instructed the apostle Paul to write about, watch this, spiritual leaders, like pastors, like deacons, it literally says in Scripture that people that aspire to those levels of spiritual leadership must have people in their home. It wasn't even an option. It was this. It was like, look, you can't shelter yourself away from others. Like, like you have to have an open door policy. You have to live a life where other people can come into your home, and you're going to see the power of that in just a minute. But here's the other thing they did. They helped each other financially. 
They did. They blessed one another. They, they gave to one another as they saw need with one another. That was the early picture of, of community. I, I think we've lost something about early biblical community while we've been chasing the American dream. The American dream, in, in, all, in all sincerity, okay, and I love, I love our country, okay, so I'm not bashing it at all. I love our country. I'm thankful for our country. I fought for our country, and I would do it again. But here's the point. The point is this. In our American dream and chasing it, the American dream says this. You have an individual house that isn't attached to anyone else, where it's got its little bit of privacy around it. Drive your individual car that no one else is going to ride in. Pull into your individual garage that no one else is going to park in. Right? Eat, eat the food you want. Door dash to your house if that's what you choose to. Like, it basically, it's this. It's like, like live in this independence and then have a lot of bills with our credit cards and our debt ratio and all these kind of things that drives you to have to work hard. Um, have a very busy schedule because that makes a person look important. And all of this does one big massive thing. It drives us to a little island of individuality that causes us to be separated from the community of doing life with others. And in chasing our American dream, we've ran away from the biblical sense of community. And we've lost the essence of what God put us on this earth to do. Can I just ask you a, just a simple question? Who, who really knows you? I mean, who really knows you? Who is somebody that really knows your life? They know the ins and the outs. They know the good and the bad. They know the, they know the things that no one else knows. Who, who really knows you? And I bet you that list has got either A, no one on it, or if it has one person on it, if I actually drilled down a little bit, you would say, okay, well, if the definition is that they really, they know, they know, about, they know everything about me, and they know the good and the bad. They know the things I try to hide from everyone else. No, they don't know those things. Okay, then, then no one really knows me. See, unfortunately, if I really drilled down with you and we had coffee together, you would unfortunately, and maybe even myself, would have to say, does anybody really know me? Meaning this, do I really have community with others? Like you go to Israel and there's still people that live in kibbutz, in a kibbutz, right? And, and they live in this environment where uh, that was October 7th. One of the kibbutz got attacked Right? And so here's this community of people that do life with each other. They watch each other's kids. Oh, they, they, have, they have this industry that the kibbutz puts on, and all of that money goes into a pool, and the needs of everyone is being met. And that's a very interesting picture. And I know that it's not, it's not what we're going to do here in America, but there's still people that are living that way. The closest, thing, the closest thing here at New Life that we can even get to biblical community is what we call a life group. And a life group is where you, got, you get a chance to truly get to know people, where you're actually in one another's homes, where you're sharing life with each other, where people actually know what's going on in your life. This is where spiritual transformation can happen. It's found when we give ourselves willfully, we devote ourselves to it. We choose to be in each other's homes. We share one another's burdens. It's in a life group. And God designed you for community, by the way. I just want you to know this. Okay, If life feels like you're on a rat race, let me just say this. Slow down a little bit. Find some community. You're going to find more peace and joy in your life. Why? Because God designed you for community. And here's what God designed community to do. God designed community to bring spiritual transformation to your life. You weren't meant to do life alone. Take a look at what Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says about that. It says two people are better off than one, for they can help each other, what? Succeed. If one person falls down, then the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people laying closely together can keep each other warm, but how can one person be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand what? Back to back and conquer, right? Three are even better for a triple bladed, braided cord is not easily broken. I want you to look at the power of community. Right there in that scripture, it told us three critical things about community. First, here's what happens when you choose to do life with one another. You succeed. I don't know about you. I want to succeed in life. I don't want this to be average. I, I don't want to just go through the motions of life. I bet you in all of our lives, we would say, I want to succeed. God says it's found when you do community 
with, watch this, others. He's, he's not even, even talking about even a marriage. He, he's talking about community with others, that when you do that, there's, you can succeed. Here's the other one. You can overcome defeat. How do you guys know? Life is tough. I need people to help me overcome defeat. And so do you. So this is the power of community. We can succeed. We can overcome defeat. And watch this. Someone's got your back. In a world, in a world where people stab each other in the back, I want somebody to have my back. Are you with me? Well, guys, that comes through community. It doesn't just accidentally happen. So let me give you three quick things on how community can really bring spiritual transformation to your life. So if you're taking notes or you're writing these down, then I just want you to look at this. Community can transform you, watch this, first and foremost, through accountability. Through accountability. Now, nobody likes accountability. <laughs> All right? When we hear the word accountability, we start stepping back, right? Like accountability, why? Because we have the wrong view of accountability. Here's how we see accountability. We, we look at accountability and we say, oh man, I'm going to have to lose my privacy if I'm going to be in an accountable relationship with someone else. If someone truly knows what's going on in my life, I'm going to lose my privacy. Um, here, here's another one. Accountability means Accountability means someone else gets to tell me what to do. Nobody's telling me what to do. We see it that way, right? Uh, and that means also that accountability means someone can actually tell me, no, no, you, you, you're not doing that. No, you're not going there. I don't like anybody to tell me, no. We got a wrong view of accountability. Can I, can I just give you the, the proper view of accountability, because accountability happens when we're in community with one another. You just need to know that. Biblical community has accountability. So if you truly want to see spiritual transformation in your life, you're going to have to embrace accountability. And so I want you to start seeing it the right way. Here's what accountability really should look like in your life. Accountability puts trusted people in your corner. Every single one of us, every day that we wake up, is like a human being that walks into a boxing match and it's just you against whatever it is you face. And I'm gonna tell you right now, no great boxer, no great UFC fighter, no great wrestler, no great person that walks out onto a mat all by themselves, not a team sport, but an individual against the world or an individual against an individual, nobody succeeds in that unless they got a great corner. Unless they got people to take care of them. They got people to look out for them. They got people to see their blind spots. They, they, everybody needs a great corner. Accountability in community puts people in your corner that you can trust that are going to be looking out for your best interest. That's accountability. Accountability also pushes you to be your very best. Pushes you to be your very best instead of cutting corners. I mean, I'm going to tell you this. Like, look, many of us, left to our own demise, are going to take the short, shortest route to get where we want to go. We're going to cut corners. That means that at times, we're going to breach our own integrity to cut a corner. At times, we're going to lower the standard. We're going to lower the expectation to get the outcome. But that may not be the best for us. So accountability puts someone in our lives that says, look, I think you're cutting the corner here. I don't think that's going to be your very best and they, they help hold us to a higher standard of life so that the outcome is greater than it would, have, it would have been by yourself. But accountability also does this. It keeps you emotionally healthy. Did you realize this? That many of us deal with some kind of emotional, emotional and mental dysfunction of some level. I know you don't like that word, but all of us are in that. We're all in there. And accountability keeps you emotionally healthy. Why? Because when someone knows your deepest struggles, guess what happens to your struggles? They lose power. When, when, your, when your greatest battles, when, when they stay in the private, they, they, keep the, they keep their greatest strength in your life. And so when your struggles come out of the private that just is for you, and they come out into the open, out into the light, where someone else can help carry it, then all of a sudden those struggles lose power. So your struggles, they live in the dark, but they can't live in the light. They can't. So that's accountability. But the ultimate picture of the power of transformative you know, uh, you know, work in your life that comes through accountability happens in something in a way that probably few of you are even thinking about. That the ultimate transformative power of accountability comes when you 
start saying, I am going to be the example of Christ for someone else, and I'm going to help them become all that God wants them to be. Did you guys realize that some of the last words that Jesus said was this to you and to me, go and make disciples? And now many of us feel unqualified to go and make a disciple. But Jesus gave that to you as a form of also accountability. Because the Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He says, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And some of you go, well, that's the Apostle Paul. I can't say that. How can I say that? My life doesn't qualify for that. No. No, it's not that your life doesn't qualify for it. It's that you're unwilling to do it. Everyone's life qualifies. It's are we willing to live a life that others could actually imitate Christ. See, there's something about you saying to another person, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, you're not going to say it exactly like that. You're going to say this. Hey, how can I help you grow spiritually? Can we meet for coffee? You want to be in my life group? Like being a life group leader, not just attending a life group, is going to bring spiritual transformation to you on a tenfold, on a 10x return. That's the greatest element of accountability. When you put yourself in a situation where you are leading others, I guarantee you it starts changing. It starts changing the way you think and it starts changing the way you act. It starts changing your behavior. It starts changing your beliefs. That accountability will bring the greatest amount of spiritual transformation to your life. So can I just say this to some of you? Stop going to a life group and start leading a life group. Well, I'm not qualified. Go see Pastor Dean. He'll help you figure it out. I don't know what I'm doing. Go see Pastor Dean. He'll help you figure it out. Pastor Dean oversees our life groups. Go to Pastor Dean and help you figure out. Some of you have been attending a life group long enough. It's time to start leading one. It's time to start getting a few people around you, whether that's some married couples or that's men or that's women, right? It's time to start leading. Some of you, you're not growing anymore because you're still following and God's asking you to start leading. So I need you to take that bold step if you want to see spiritual transformation in your life. Now look, my name's Jeff. I'm your pastor. I love you. I'm challenging you. And I stepped on some of your toes. And I'm not sorry. (laughs) Okay, here's another reason, all right? Here's another thought about community. How community brings transformation to your life. Community can transform you through authentic relationships. Few people actually have someone that would be called an authentic friend, someone that you can really trust, someone that really knows the ins and the outs of your life. They know the highs, they know the lows. They know what you struggle with today. They know what you used to struggle with. Like, few people have a true friend like that. A lot of us have friends, but authentic friendship, few of us have. A lot of us have acquaintances, but authentic relationships, few of us have. And social media hasn't done anything to help this. Right? So you look at your social media right now and you're like, hey, I've got 100 friends. No, you have 100 people that are following you. That doesn't mean them, that they're friends. Right? Hey, I got two people that liked my weird photo. They're friends. No, that's just two weird people. We, we've equated followers to friends and likes to friends and we've redefined the definition of friend. And guys, I'm telling you, that's not friendship. Okay, at New Life Church, New Life Church should be a place where you actually truly do find authentic friends. It should be a place. And in life groups, that's what you're going to find. You're going to find authentic friendship gets developed when you do life with each other in community. Here's the sad truth. Unfortunately, authenticity is the exact opposite of what you find in many churches. And that's sad. That's the sad truth. Authenticity is a rare gem to be found in a local church. Why is that? Well, instead of openness and honesty and humility, there tends to be pretending, role-playing, politics and politicizing things and superficial politeness. Unfortunately, At many churches, there's just a sense of shallow conversation that takes place in a lobby because we see each other for an hour once a week. People wear masks. We don't really truly know each other. 
We tend to wear a mask. We, we project an image that we want other people to really see of us. We, we're guarded. We don't really let people see our real hurts and our fears and our worries. Right? And so things tend to be a lot of superficial. And we, we, we act like everything is really, really great. Can, can I say this to you? that Well, let's make sure that that's not New Life Church. Because that behavior... Living life like that, it kills, it destroys authentic friendship. It forces authentic friendship out of the envelope of possibility because no one can be real because everyone has to be guarded. Everything has to be great. Everything has to be good. No one can really struggle. No one can hurt. No one can feel pain. Everything has to be, I wear a mask. When I come in here, this is who I I want you guys to see. Can I just say this to you? That if we want a church uh, that has authentic relationships that are being built in a church that has authentic friendships that are being developed that if that's what you want in your life and that's what you want for our church then we have to start leading our lives that way you can't expect someone else to to start it you have to start it so if you don't have it in your life and you're waiting and you're like upset because no one in this church has come alongside you and you don't feel like you got close relationships and you're going to bounce to another church and maybe you're going to find it there i'm going to tell you this wherever you go there you are so if you really truly want authentic friendship in your life and authentic relationship, here's the, here's the truth of it, and you may not like it, but I'm your friend, right? You have to start leading it. you got to find someone that you can trust, and you got to start being more real with them. Even though the last time you did it brought pain, you got to push past that. you got to let those things come into the light. The more you live in the light, the more you let your life be seen by someone else, Guys, the more authentic relationships you're going to have. This is what 1 John 1 says about it. It says that, look, look, if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, watch this, then we have what? Fellowship with each other. Fellowship with each other is found in the light. If you claim to have no sin, if you claim, I'm, all, I'm good, I'm perfect, put on my mask, put on the guards, Put it all up. Everything's good with me. If you claim to have no sin, who are you fooling? You're just fooling yourself. You're setting yourself up for disaster. Here's an interesting point, and I find this pretty interesting, that the world, the world looks at intimacy, and the world sees intimacy happening in the dark. It's in the dark. God sees intimacy happening in the light. He sees authenticity happening in the light. He sees real relationships being built in the light. Well, what do we try to do? Man, we, we, try, to, we try to hide our hurts. We try to hide our faults. We try to hide our fears. We, we try to hide our flaws in the dark. But when we're open and we're honest, we get a chance to live in the light. And that's where authentic relationships are found. Authentic relationships are found in the light. So guys, look, the more you step into the light, the more you open up your heart, the more you find someone you can trust and you share your life with them, the more transformation is going to happen in your life. But that's going to take courage. It's going to take humility. You're going to have to face your fears. You're going to have to face your anxiety, right? You're going to have to face past like hurt that's come from relationships. You're going to have to face all of that and push past it and go, This person is not that person. This person doesn't have to be the same hurtful person that that person was. Let the past go. Trust God for a preferred future. God's got something better for your life, but it's going to require authentic relationships that are found through community. So why would someone take such a risk? Because it's one of the few places you can actually start to find true spiritual transformation in your life authentic relationships let me give you the last one really quickly community transforms you when you serve others there's something that happens in community that you start to serve one another's needs you start to bring something to the table it's not just what you're going to get out of it it's what you bring to it and when you serve others, spiritual transformation can happen in your life. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4 says this. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Guys, I'm telling you that, that when you do that, here's what happens. Here's what transforms in your life, your priorities and your values. 
When, when Kim and I lived down in downtown Omaha at 20, 22nd and Leavenworth, we lived in an apartment complex on purpose 10 and a half years ago before we moved here. We lived with prostitutes, drug addicts. We lived with people that were one government paycheck away from homelessness. We lived amongst people that at the first of the month they got a, they got a check, and by the middle of the month they had nothing left. We lived with people that had nowhere to hide. We lived with people that the only economy they had to share with one another was a story. They couldn't impress you with the car they drove. They couldn't impress you with the house that they had. They couldn't impress you with the, you know, the wardrobe that they have. They couldn't impress you by taking you out for dinner. They couldn't impress you with any of those things. The only thing they had was friendship. The only thing they had was a story. And Kim and I, we learned a lot about life when we lived there for three years of our lives, on mission, on purpose, living amongst the poorest of the poor of our entire state, living amongst the most addicted of our entire state before we moved to the oasis of Kearney, Nebraska. People have the same struggles in Kearney, Nebraska. They just have the ability to hide them. People have the same issues in Kearney, Nebraska. They just have the garage to pull into so they don't have to talk to that neighbor. They got the back deck that's really nice. That is, the old wood's been taken out and the fake wood's been brought in so they never have to stain it again. Because they had $10,000 to drop and they didn't know what to do with it. And so they bought fake wood. Right, you see what I'm saying? Like, we, we have the same issues, but why? Because we're human beings. But when we lived there, our priorities and values changed. What's the closest thing I can do for you? I can't tell you to go down and live at 20, 22nd and Leavenworth. Many of you, you, you would never make it. I'm looking at you. I can tell. <laughs> Remember, I'm your pastor. I love you. But what can I do? I can take you on a go trip where you're going to build community with people as you travel overseas someplace and you start to see the way the world really lives and you start to see that there's a bunch of people that have so much less than me but they've got so much more than me. A bunch of people that they don't have what I have but they've got something I don't have. They've got a peace and they've got a joy and they've got a serenity and they've got a faith. And as something can start changing your priorities, you start serving others and you start putting others first. See, serving others helps you to see a new way to love people. It helps you to start seeing a new way to fight for the needs of others. It, helps, it gives you a new way to start expressing compassion. So if you want to see true spiritual transformation happen in your life, start serving others. This is, that's what Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 through 3 tells us as we wrap up this message. It says this, share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think that you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You aren't that important. That's one of the most encouraging scriptures in the entire Bible. <laughs> it's helpful to be reminded, I'm not that important. But God, you gave me something. You gave us one another to serve in community with each other. And as you serve others, you get to grow spiritually. So I just want you to think about, just think about the role of community and the role that community could have in your life. I just want you to think for a moment. Just close your eyes at all campuses, all right? I just want you to think about this picture. Think about you in community. Think about you at someone else's house. Those people at your house sharing a meal I want you to see yourself laughing with one another. I want to see you, you know, sharing stories that are so moving it brings everyone to tears. I want, to, I want you to see each other sitting at that table praying for each other, actually reaching out and taking each other's hands. I want you to see that right now and praying for one another. I, I, want, I want you to see them at the door, you know, so thankful that they were at your house and that you hugged each other before you left. I want, I want you to see later in the week when, you know, you hit, a, you hit a troubled spot. And I want you to see yourself taking your phone out and texting them and going, do you got time for coffee? I really need somebody to talk to you right now. I, wa I want you to see somebody who really knows you. They know the worst about you and the best about you, but they love you anyways. 
I, w- I want you to see yourself sitting in a home of other new lifers, in a circle, and the Bible is open and you're discussing the Bible. I want you to see that right now. I want, I want you to see others sharing and in, in, in your mind you're going, wow, that's good. And I want you to see yourself sharing and seeing the look on everyone else's face like, wow, thank you for sharing that. I want you to see that. Now look up at me. All of that and more can be yours. All of that and more can be yours. But you're going to have to take the first steps. Strive after authentic relationships. Put yourself in a position of accountability. And go into those things willing to serve others before they have to serve you. You want spiritual transformation for your life? You want a metamorphosis moment to take place? It comes through community. And that means you have to lead it. So sign up for a life group. Find a life group. Sign up for it. Don't wait for someone to ask you. Go to mynewlifechurch.com. They're listed there. Get in one of them. Say, I want, to, I want more information about that life group. If that life group doesn't work out, don't run away. Go to another one. You keep looking until you find the community that God has for you so that you can be the best version that God designed you to be. Amen? Stand with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that today what we have seems good, but what you have in your heart for us is even better. Thank you, Lord, that through Jesus Christ we can have community with one another. That through Jesus Christ, your word says that we are brothers and sisters. We belong to the same family. One God, one Savior, Jesus Christ. We submit to you, Lord. We, we surrender to you. And as we surrender to you, that we want to walk in community with other believers. Thank you that you gave us one another to encourage us, inspire us. You gave us one another to help us see the spiritual transformation that you have in your heart for our lives. Lord, I just pray over this congregation that there would be a spiritual, a spiritual metamorphosis that would take place in their life. It would happen as they do life with each other. So Lord, give us the boldness, give us the courage, and give us the humility to step out today and sign up for that life group. In Jesus' name, amen.